Hey guys, it's Alex Honeycutt, aka Radio Runner on Instagram. This is a fun video today. I had the opportunity to spend some time with some good classmates and friends of mine, as well as our instructor and friend, Kenny Vo. And Kenny is more than just a powerhouse of an artist, but he is also very generous with his time and sat down with us to talk a little bit more about the industry and catch up since we've finished WB2 with him, or World Building 2. So the first half of this video up until about the 40 minute mark is myself and my classmates Brian and Jessica going over our finals and some of our thoughts about the class in general. After that, Kenny manages to hop in and it's a lot of fun from there. So if you're mainly interested in hearing the discussion with Kenny, I have the time stamped in the description down below. You can just click that. I won't feel bad about it. All right, and with that, let's hop right in. Okay, we are set up, I think, the levels are all right. If they're not, then this is unusable and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it sounds at least decent, so. We can work with that. Okay, so we can just hop right in and talk about WB2. For WB2, I'm joined by some of my students, or not students, my God, <laughs> some of my classmates. <laughs> Jessica and Brian, and we had a really good experience going through the class uh, with Kenny as our instructor. Do you guys want to introduce yourself or have anything that you want me to show off? Brian, we can start with you. Uh, I got called out first. Um, yeah, it's totally. So um, yeah, my name is Brian. I'm a brainstorm student. I've taken two classes, getting ready to take my third. I have been uh, working with Alex uh, together. We've been kind of going through the classes together. So I've been studying art for about, I'm going to say like three years solidly, um, like seriously, like, oh, I think I'm going to do this. So uh, when Brainstorm went online, it was like, for sure, let's do that. So um, <laughs> to answer your question, yeah, I think I don't know if there's any one week that I'd want to talk about more than others, because I think every week had really something, something to he really did a good job of like building up top on top of things that we had been doing previously. So I won't ramble on too long. I'll let, I'll let Jessica go next. So everybody kind of knows who is who. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Jessica. Um, so I've been taking brainstorm classes since the summer of last year. Uh, I've taken, I think WB2 would count as my fourth class um, with brainstorm. And I met Alex and Brian in this particular class specifically. Like like Brian says, it's hard to like kind of like single out like a particular week in the entire curriculum. But if there's anything we should probably talk about is probably like like the workflow um, of our final projects probably just because it pretty much encompasses um, kind of like kind of like everything that we've learned so far. Um, mm just all squ squished up in like three weeks, if anything. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. The, the finals are kind of indicative of everything that we had learned. Man, we let, let's talk about them, right? Let's just dive in. The finals were wild. So because looking back on it, that was three weeks of prep, essentially. And so what do you do? He had to start with color compositions. Maybe I can find 20 of them too. <laughs> 20 in a row. No biggie. <laughs> just hey why don't you come up with something from scratch and see if you can make 20 of them and make them look good as good as i managed to do in an hour and it looks like a professional concept and so the assignment for week seven that kenny gave us was we sat through and he gave us a lecture on color theory and he asked us to come up with different concepts based off of a keyword that we all agreed on and <laughs> The options were what? <laughs> they were suburb, sandwich, <laughs> waterfall. Sandwich. Yeah. I mean, it was a mess to work with. And I think suburb <laughs> was an easy choice amongst the group. But then I, mean, I think almost all of us were thinking like we, we were like debilitated for a week. What do you even do with the concept of a suburb? Because it's so normal. And Kenny had told us we need it to be. Like you, it makes you think about a suburb, but the last thing I want to see is a normal modern suburbia. <laughs> Great. So the, the one right. thing that defines <laughs> suburbia, we can't do <laughs> but the houses in a row in a, in a modern town. Right. But Jessica, I think you did a great job with these. Um, you want to talk through some of your thought processes? Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, 
I think I think for all of us, it's been like a huge struggle so far because like you reach a certain point with your ideas that kind of like halfway through, you're like ten sketches in, and you don't know what to do with like the remaining ten, for example. Um, so at least my strategy for these were to come up with three keywords for each kind of like world setting, and then create a one sentence pitch to help direct um, where I want to kind of like what, what I kind of like want to do story wise or intent wise with the sketches. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think overall I had, was it, was it five ideas in total that yeah. I split up into four different sketches? Each page of yeah, yours so, was a full um, idea, right? Yes, that's right. Um, some of them were more, what, some of them were closer to a literal suburb and then some were more loosely inspired by the idea of a suburb. Um, I, I think some of the ideas I had um, in the end were, I think three of them were closer to a literal suburb. And then out of the last two were more kind of like fantasy um, where I took like the community aspect of what it means to have a suburb set up. And, and was that um, with your your yeah. uh, blue sky and the Greek ones? That was more of a community. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. Personally, I just I usually tend to gravitate more towards fantasy, just 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 because I feel like it's always easier to kind of like come up with wilder things. Yeah, it doesn't have That's to be grounded like, either, right? <laughs> You can just, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. It looks like that. It's fine. Yeah, you but, can get as crazy as you want. And then um, for the ground and stuff, it's a bit more tough because, like, now you have to think about different ways to make the most normal thing look interesting. You blew my, you blew me away because you kind of held out on us with this, uh, like, hotline Miami aesthetic <laughs> you didn't show this one off until <laughs> class happened i thought whoa what the heck pink and blue my favorite these are really really cool well, i thought you did you. a great job thank you oh you yeah absolutely. absolutely what are you thinking i i'd like to know what are you thinking about when you pick colors are you are you specifically going in and saying i have a color palette that i want to work with because they're, they're all very harmonious and like they there's a very particular like they have this saturation level that feels really vibrant from page to page just yeah curious. uh i think yeah for sure um there are some thumbnails where i know almost right away what colors i want and then there are some where i adopt a different process where i kind of like arrive to a color palette if that makes sense mm-hmm. um for 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 the thumbnails that have a color palette that I know what it's going to be, those tend to fall into like the basic like color theories of, oh, let's just go with, I start. I don't know why I'm, I'm forgetting the words. Compliment, let's go with complementary colors with this one, with blue being the base because I want this particular sketch to be sad, for example. So sad, blue, okay. Do I want it to be analogous or complementary? And I kind of like go from there. Um, so that's one strategy I do. Another strategy I also adopt, um, is kind of like, I would take a photo sometimes that has like, kind of like a mood or feel that I really like. And then I would kind of like either overlay it over my black and white sketch, um, or like color pick from it to help, uh, find like a color, uh, that might work for the, for the particular sketch. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I guess my last strategy is kind of like using the selective color sliders you thought you can use on photoshop sometimes i'll drop a color uh, like a base local color and then i would drastically transform the entire thing with selective colors because it's basic it basically kind of like it's kind of like a fun way to find colors because like if it were up to me i probably wouldn't you know choose those colors in the first place <laughs> um just because is yeah especially this uh hot hot pink and blue one, I would have never in a million years picked those colors by myself from the get-go. Oh, that's interesting. So maybe yeah. if, if I know what you're talking about, I think I've seen Loish do it, where she puts colors down, but then she, when she makes selections to edit things, she pulls up her color balance slider and just pushes things around and just says, do, do I like what that looks like? 
rather than going to her color wheel and, and trying to find something else. Is that kind of what you're mm-hmm. describing? Yeah, pretty much. That's cool. And I think it, yeah. And I think the nice thing is like the, it, when you give yourself more options to play with, you'll have a wider variety of kind of like color range in your sketches, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Cause I feel like certain processes have a tendency to produce similar results at the end of the day. So if you're trying to go for kind of like, if you're trying to go for more variety in your work, you should definitely play with different types of processes. I like it. How about you, Brian? <laughs> you want to, you want to share? Oh yeah, sure. Here's your um, uh, so color from, thumbnails. Yeah. So this was, uh, like you said, he kind of wanted us just a thumbnail riffing off of suburbs. Somehow we ended up with suburbs <laughs> and I, I really did like the way that he kind of explained it. He's like, don't do suburbs, do suburbs plus something completely random, like suburbs plus lobster <laughs> or, you know, suburbs plus, uh, you know, tree leaf or something. And and once he kind of said that, that helped me some. Um, so I, one thing I kind of picked up on from uh, doing earlier brainstorm classes, and this is something that I suffered with previously in my work, was not really referencing enough. Um, I would try to always do everything out of my head. And, you know, wouldn't you know it, usually that doesn't work out as well. And so first thing I kind of did for this was start to look at different images and films and things to kind of get kind of get some ideas. So actually, I did a set of these. I probably did about 20 comps and I threw them all out because I, I didn't I didn't like where it was going at all. And I think fortunately wow. for us this week, I'm pretty sure we had an extra week because he was sick. Um, or hurt or something like that. So I kind of dodged a bullet there. <laughs> now he was a <laughs> was big able baby, to go back man. In. He pinched his back in his sleep. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, he pinched his bit. He pinched his back. Oh, <laughs> Getting boy. old, but pushing it thirty. Up, yep, <laughs> sitting in front of a computer all day. <laughs> um, so I kind of dodged a bullet, and that gave me an extra week to really kind of recharge my batteries. And so I kind of was. I kind of like this idea of, you know. Well, I'll start with this one. This one I wanted to do a little bit more. Um, I really wanted to push it, especially with the colors. So I would try to pick um, a value scheme of just kind of black and whites. So I, you know, in these images, if you look, there's always some heavy darks in there. And so my sketches were just those darks versus lights. And then I would pick two colors and kind of start going at it based on the mood that I wanted to go for. So I really did try to think of it in terms of what would it feel like to be standing there? And then as I was going, it kind of turned into like this MMO. So I had this like idea of like M- MMO style suburbs. Like maybe there's, what kind of different buildings do you have in a suburb? Like what's in a community there? Maybe you have a church building or a place of worship and they have like, where do they eat? Where are the restaurants? Where do they gather? You know, all these people are living around there, but they still have all these different places to go to. So I tried to I try to think of that for each one of these different comps is like, what would this particular place be? And even though they're very quick and there's not a lot of detail in my mind, I was already thinking like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe this is where um, they go for, you know, coffee, or maybe this is where they all gather and they hold celebrations. And, mm-hmm. and I really tried to, to change the colors between them almost just to kind of spark ideas, like Jessica was saying, like, let's just see where this goes. And then I looked at a lot of, um, I can't remember exactly where it's like, it was like African style and it wasn't ancient. It was like more modern kind of African reference that I was using for like my shape language and stuff. Cause everything kind of has these like, you know, peaks on it. I remember and yeah, you I looked at uh, Guild Wars too, hadn't you? Yeah, Possibly. I was looking at Guild Wars 2 concept art, and especially, like, if you look at Theo Prenz. Check Theo him Prenz. out. And let's all be sad, because he's so good. <laughs> so I love this kind of stuff. Like, if you look at, like, his his palettes, it's very otherworldly. You know what I mean? Like, there's all of that. You got the whole rainbow in there, and it's very, very moody and very, very works well. And... You know, I kind of was riffing off of this a little bit. And obviously, my con- I'm no Theo Prince. My iron is nearly as interesting. But um, I really liked how he had these um, variety of colors. And it did feel like you were in a, a very separate locale. So I kind of was riffing on what it would be like to be 
like a guild wars or this kind of aesthetic with uh um being suburbs yeah and then for my second my second group so yeah <laughs> don't look at those too much because oh uh don't cut between theirs and mine uh <laughs> <laughs> you see that back jump. to reality <laughs> uh, back to reality yeah so for my second one i tried to do a little bit more grounded and i was uh my wife was watching the movie The Martian with Matt Damon, and it got me thinking about how, uh, you know, right now there's like the rover on Mars and all this kind of stuff. And so I was like, OK, what about like a near future? Like what if instead of there already is a suburb, like they're in the middle of building it or constructing it or they're trying to get up there because the first group of people would be getting ready to live out there. So I kind of came up with this story of, um, you know, maybe it's like a couple construction workers or maintenance workers and they're and they're getting ready to construct this this suburbia this place where people are going to live out here on mars and i tried to change the shape language but you know it's a little bit more rounded forms and stuff like that but i really tried to keep the palettes and the colors consistent this time where before i was trying on purpose to change them up between shots just to kind of see Mm -hmm. what was interesting um and this one i really tried to be consistent like it was the same place and i wanted it to be fairly I, I try not to go too bright with anything on my values. I tried to keep everything fairly dark because I wanted it to be a little bit more threatening, a little bit more scary. Like there was there was some more risk involved. Obviously, they're like on Mars and I, I didn't want it to be so futuristic sci-fi where they're like, you know, they're just out there on Mars and we don't really question how they're surviving. It's just like, ah, it's sci-fi. They're fine. It was more like, well, there's they're always in this potential danger and risk and, and you know, trying to deal with the harsh environment. Um, and I and I kind of changed the style, like Jessica said before, kind of kind of went a different direction with the way that I rendered these two. So so they looked hopefully a little bit more grounded than than before. I can tell. I, I think in your fantasy set, each one has like you like you said, deliberately different colors, even where you might be denoting water. You, you chose purple right. just to see how you can push a power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you don't mind, I will show some of my stuff go right ahead i'll keep it short and sweet it's more about you guys taking the time out tonight um for my thumbnails i was really racking my head (laughs) because i i struggled through that through all of kenny's class i don't know what it was but i had this mental block where it's just like (laughs) hey pitch me anything like anything oh my god oh my god what do i do yeah Oh. You would message me like right after class would end and you'd be like, I'm in a panic. This is too much. I don't know. What to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nonsense. I'm like suburbs. And I was writing out paragraphs and like, well, if it's suburbs and that means that you have to have buildings and then you're going to have to have things like a, a, tra- a street system and people who go to areas to congregate and you're going to have to have a city council and a school and like how do you fit all that how do you design a (laughs) suburb without a suburb well finally you guys were able to uh push me out of the realm of being normal (laughs) Uh, i i looked to riot's star guardians as inspiration let's pull that up because i just love that my goodness look at this artwork yeah this is my favorite I've never played League of Legends, but man, it's like this whole website is so fun. You can go, they've got alt universes, the Odyssey universe. Why isn't it loading? Okay, never mind. KDA. Oh, KDA. And they've got different exposés and stats and telling us their blood type in here, I think, at some point. Like, <laughs> that's because, oh, you know, it's like uh, Korean and Japanese, they, they do that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, in this Starfall short story, I remember the artist's name, but it's not coming to mind. But she has these wonderful little illustrations of kind of this comic to go along with this story. And I thought that would be a lot of fun to work with. So I thought, OK, Star Guardians, let's try and pitch my own kind of world. So I went with elves who live on mountain peaks that can reach the stars. And so they, they're they kind of a, a civilization that is rooted in praising stars and the sun as kind of like the heavens and deities. And so I thought, what if one day our main character sees a comet? They, she and her friends go and discover said comet. And they find it in the forest and trying to change up the color palette to match like 
as if these were color keys, just change the mood. And all of a sudden they get powers, they transform in, in kind of Sailor Moon-esque fashion. Our main character becomes a Star Guardian. So I imagine there being some kind of showdown in a suburban neighborhood. And then I also tried to flesh out ideas like what would the school look like if I was better at designing Elvish architecture? <laughs> and uh, this one here was kind of like a star portal. I imagined that if at the right time of day, they could, if the stars aligned, they could use it to travel to different mountain peaks because it, it would be the only way to get from one peak to the next. And the other option was a Reaper Underworld is what I called it. And I kind of had this comedic animated movie pitch that I thought maybe like somebody like Illumination Studios could handle where it's real life in its normal suburbs, except we're in the underworld and we are we follow the daily lives of this married couple who moves to San Francisco, but in hell. And they have to go through all of the normal challenges of being suburbanites, but also having to reap souls. So so I tried exploring concepts like um, the master bedroom and not having a bed, but having a coffin. And for man and he and she morning commute, he gets stuck in traffic. I was pretty pr proud of this pun. Satanic and <laughs> Satan Inc. or Satanic. Um, oh. So That's he goes to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alcatraz really nice. could be a university. The quarterly sales report, maybe I would have made this Satan if, if I had done it again. <laughs> um, their, re their souls are going down for not reaping enough, and he's really mad at the, the C-suite for not delivering. And then these were two other concepts that I rolled with. But overall, it was very challenging to pull that off in 14 days total, but in reality, like nine or 10, because I spent so long yeah. thinking about ideas. But yeah, it was right. Fun. Let's go over. Yeah, I think. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think um, for being just compositions, you know, you you really did nail it for just being like quick, like your idea, ideas are very clear those and i think that's uh, that was pretty cool for sure because you fleshed them out at least way more than i did i was just trying to get a general impression and you went like all out like it's very clear <laughs> what's going on in yours so i think you did you killed it man i think if i were to do this again um i would say that these went too far because i i started rendering yeah, probably and yeah some of these were outright paintings like this one but mm -hmm. let's just say it was unnecessary <laughs> As artists, though, it's it's hard to stop yourself sometimes. You know, you want to keep going, and it's hard it's hard to like pump the brakes. It's really hard to stop here at this point with this um, ocean suburb villa place, where mm -hmm. the moment I start introducing shadows, my oh render mode, let's turn it on. That that part of the brain is activated, and and like okay, well, yeah. I put shadows in. I need highlights, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jessica. Show us your final before we just go and do like a normal overview of the rest of the class. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, so in the end, um, for the final, I picked the set of ideas uh, that mainly focused on kind of like an Indonesian inspired kind of community where they coexist with these giant birds, um, which were also inspired by, if you guys aren't familiar, um, kind of like, Balinese uh, Hindu folklore um, of the Garuda bird. It's basically a divine mount of the gods, uh, but I kind of like took a more kind of like grounded spin on that where they're, they're just large creatures that live side by side with this community of people who kind of like live on, like kind of like on top of cliffs um, to get away from evil serpent not evil serpents but like pred predatory serpents that live on the kind of like jungle ground um so a lot of the shots you see um in my final are kind of like elevated um you don't see much of the ground at all um there's like a lot of clouds sky and even on the even when you get into like settlements uh they're kind of like on wooden platforms Supported That's such a by cool concept. Um, Something about yeah. places <laughs> being elevated, you know, it's very fun. 
Yeah, I, I'm a big sucker for skies, honestly. So it's part of the reason why I chose it too. It's like, oh yeah, I get to put in as many clouds as I want. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell, um, man, the, the way you compose clouds is so, it's full of energy. Really nice. I, I, yeah, I, I do love whiskey clouds, that's for sure. So yeah, uh, if just to recap, we had to come up with three shots in the end. Um, one is a far widescreen establishing type of shot. Our second shot had to be something that's more middle range. And then our final shot had to be like a close up. Um, so for my project, um, we kind of did, uh, I kind of did what we did with our midterm, um, which was to kind of like make a map first and then kind of like base your three shots um, around the map. So you would set up your map, put in your cameras and kind of like, kind of like finalize or sketch up what it, those camera positions look like um, on screen. But yeah, I don't know. What, what else should I talk about? That's okay. I guess I could That's... talk about, <laughs> sorry, I'm freezing up because like, I'm like, oh, now what should I talk about? <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have to talk yeah. about anything else. It's fine. We can, we can go to Brian <laughs> sure. if you like. Uh, that's totally fine. <laughs> okay. Let's, and let's onward. <laughs> what do you want to go All right. with, Brian? Um, start from the top. Yeah, let's start with the top since we already kind of talked about that, and then uh, we can go down from there. Um, so this this was my final, and I um, I kind of ended up just doing one shot instead of several. Um, kind of ran into a time crunch there at the end, but I really tried to. This was my to really use the lessons that we learned from Kenny. Um, so really use his methodology and way of thinking and way of working, which which is a little bit unusual for me. But actually, I, I learned a lot and I'm glad that I, I attempted to do that. So I really um, you can kind of see my methodology there on it, too. So I started with a sketch for my composition. It's where I took one of the frames that I liked from the, the previous color studies. And then I worked it up to a little bit more detailed sketch. So we kind of knew where everything was in the scene. and then and this is kind of how I did my color studies too. You can see I picked, you know, two, three values and I really just broke down what's, what are my dark shapes? What are my light shapes? And does it read? And once I had that, then it was, it was almost like coloring in a coloring book <laughs> as, as, as lame as that says. It's, it's kind of like, okay, I know what values these shapes are. So now how do I kind of pick a harmonious color scheme for it and really play with the shape design. So, so really on this, more than anything is I was playing with shapes. I was really trying to to make my shapes clear and readable and and very dynamic and trying to get a lot of energy and motion into it. And, you know, overall, I'm pretty happy with the way it worked out. Obviously, you know, there's a lot that I could do to change it. I think something that one of the teachers pointed out was like how the buildings don't really have a material rendering on it. And then once he said that to me, I was like, ah, now I can't unsee it. Like, mm. is that stone? Is that wood? Is it, is it paint? Like, I don't know. And I'm like, yep, nope, you nailed it. That's, that's something I would fix. Um, but, but overall I was pretty happy with it. And this was kind of my, kind of my mood board, I guess you could say, this is kind of what I was using is, is, is inspiration as far as like the aesthetic that I was pushing towards. Do you want to bring so, up yeah. um, our, our guest speakers? We were able to speak with Kaysen Lamb and Norris Lynn. As I'm maybe right. I'll go ahead and pull them up and so people are more familiar with their work. And they were Yeah, and that's why um very cool. No, go ahead. They were very cool people. Yeah, they were super cool, super nice. So we got to speak Norris Lynn yeah, like worked at Sony Santa Monica. Well, he does work at Sony Santa Monica. And this is all like years old work. Two years. Mm -hmm. He said that he doesn't really share much of um what he does. This is newer. I think uh, that is. I don't know if I've seen that one. Oh, oh. <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> that is funky architecture ideation. So he knows his stuff. It was pretty cool to be able to receive a critique from him. And of course, we got mm -hmm. to also hear from our past instructor, the one and only Kaysen Lamb. He's a powerhouse. Can you believe his range? The different things that he can do? Yeah. He's super solid. Cool, stylized illustration, funky stuff, <laughs> dragons. 
Why not? Sci-fi. Sci-fi cities. Yeah. You know, the usual. Yeah. So um, since so since we knew, or at least, yeah, we knew we were going to have some guest instructors, I threw in some of my previous term work in there <laughs> to kind of get it looked at. And um, so this was this was my midterm, and I did a totally different aesthetic, you can tell from my final, where I was really going for more dark fantasy, um, really riffing off of Bloodborne and Dark Souls, something like that. Um, and they, luckily, we didn't have to do ca- color for these ones. They were just value comps. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. This was this was a cool one to do. Where and this was the first time I think we really worked with using the maps, where we had to kind of design a map of the layout and then place cameras inside that map, and then show what those cameras would see. And that was an awesome lesson. That was really something because I think as artists, like you know, when we're learning and we're practicing, you know, that that's something you would do at a job. That's something you would do actually in a in a real world production setting. And mm-hmm. it's not something I had ever considered doing before, um, but it made total sense. You know, because they want to know it, it the like, different oh, yeah. locations for them to look at. They don't want just to have random pitches. They might already have a location yeah. in mind, and they want to be able to be it's, taken yeah, it's, through a story. Exactly. Like they might have. You know, when you're trying to build a world together with a team, you know, you have to all work coherently and know the area you're doing. So sometimes just one image looks cool, but it doesn't really give you a lot of information. And this kind of working was really cool as far as like showing what it would be like to be in that area and see everything kind of connected together. So, yeah, that was a fun assignment. I I had a lot of fun with that assignment. Stylistically, really tried to change the way. This was closer to how I would typically work than my final was. Um, Did you, since you're, since we're bringing it up again, I had mentioned, I had meant to mention it to you. My friend James, uh, modern day James, he was on with Thomas and Ahmed Aldori, and they were going over a Bloodborne 2 concept that Thomas had made. Did you see that? No, I didn't. Let's, let's skim through that real quick. It's very, very cool. So they just put it up four days ago. You're going to want to watch it. And, um, okay. So, Thomas is here on the left and he went through and he made like he read deep into the lore and imagined what he could do to build onto a second build off of a good ending of the original game and put it in a mm-hmm. different city that is talked about in the lore, but is never shown. And so mm-hmm. he goes for like this radically different tone where he explores brighter and more vibrant environments. Oh, nice. Cool. I love how you. Yeah, I love how we put in the uh, the health bar and the stamina bar up there on the left. Looks like it's straight out of the game, right? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it really does. He's even got like the dual states on the weapons. Like this mm-hmm. was a very, very thorough portfolio. I would highly recommend anyone to to go check it out because he he walks you through process. He he's got like this whole flow chart of ideas. Like check this out, where he's just talking oh, yeah. about. Okay, if the Lord does this, then it needs to do this. And then he's notating what he thinks are good ideas and bad ideas. Mm. Really, really good. That is rad. Yeah, I need to look at that. It's two hours, two and a half hours. So, you know, <laughs> next time you have the time. <laughs> yep. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then this, these were lighting studies. So this was um, previous to the, we're kind of going backwards through the class here. Um, so this was, uh, we had to, do different lighting scenarios in, in the same locations. So so daytime, nighttime, you know, try try to vary it up. Like let's see what it would look like in different times of day or weather condition. So this was pretty cool. This one I actually I don't know why, but for this one I didn't quite as struggle on, as I did on some of the other weeks. Like I just had very clear ideas and I think that just sometimes happens. Um, and I think honestly like you know I'm I'm comfortable working in values. <laughs> so so I was like, bam, I could do that. And then as soon as you throw in color, it's kind of a curveball of like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna pull up um, Jessica's too, just so Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this was a fun assignment. Yeah, this was. It's yeah, important um, too. We don't try enough to, you know, like relight situations, but you can get such drastically different moods. Like how you did like how you went dark here and it's very different from the scientist hanging out yeah that's creepy <laughs> I'd, I'd hope i'd be in the top frame and not the bottom frame if i had to be there <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i think i think one of the interesting things that uh, Eddie mentioned was um, 
there's more ways to play with value composition than just having a singular light source. Like if that makes sense, because like I think I think one of the few things that he mentioned with my last two sketches was I was kind of like approaching the other lighting scenarios too similarly to the first way I kind of like shot the light, which was to have like a single light source. Kind of, like, I think the biggest tip he gave everyone was kind of like, you can kind of like lie and cheat, if that makes sense, <laughs> with where your light sources are coming from. Like, because they don't have to follow scientific rules because as artists, we get to, we get to kind of like decide where our light's going to be. We get to make that controlled decision. And even in film, directors would always like cheat the light. <laughs> mm-hmm. They would have light sources when usually there aren't light sources in those places on a day-to-day setting kind of thing. Let's see what we can see if we just pull up a random screenshot from Film Grab. And Portrait of a Lady on Fire, that's a good one. See if there's any lighting that doesn't make sense. Maybe this is too real. This one looks cool. (laughs) Like, why is she so bright? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, normally if you had a person in a room that dark, you wouldn't see them, basically. Good movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I, I would say like all of those are, are doctored, you know, very, very rarely do they just plop a camera in a scene and start shooting. Like it's all very, very controlled. Super cool though. Let's see. I'll go through my finals real quick. Presenting a couple of the different projects. I think oh, this says week three. Week three was when Kenny first introduced the concept of the map, like you were saying earlier, Brian. And Mm -hmm. I thought Jessica had by far like the best implementation of it. I'm going to have to pull that up too. Jessica week three. Okay. So Jessica, you, you made this cliff face. And then since you would have a scene where you zoomed into the manor itself, you also created a secondary map and showed where your shots would be in there. And I liked that a lot, but um, these were very successful. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, very cool. It was gothic in tone. I thought this one was really cool. They, it's like you, so you you walked into the room and they they're staring at you. Fun fact: I was inspired by the Winchester Mystery House when I made these. What is that? I'm not familiar. Oh, okay. So if you don't know the Winchester Mystery House, it's basically um, okay. First of all, if you're not familiar, you could definitely um, watch uh, BuzzFeed's Unsolved series. They did one on the Winchester Mystery House, and it's basically this manor somewhere in San Jose that's that people believe are haunted <laughs> mm. um, because Sarah Winchester, the lady who built it, um, she she the story is like she wouldn't stop building. So there's like a lot of rooms that lead to nowhere, um, like a lot of corridors that have dead ends. And then there's this like this one door on the second floor that literally leads to the outside. So if you go through this door and you don't know that the, that out, that is just like, there's nothing, you would just fall straight into the ground. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the, like on the superstitious uh, side of the story, they believe that she carried like seances uh, to contact spirits of the dead because she's trying to kind of like avoid the ghosts of people who have been shot by the family's guns because they produced a lot of the guns that was used in in the war um so I, I visited the, <laughs> i visited the manor and i apparently i blew right past the seance room because i didn't realize it was the seance room it was just an empty room <laughs> so <laughs> so that's why i was like i need to make a seance room. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> the one I, need I to walked, apologize. The one I walked through had nothing. <laughs> I like that. That's, That's crazy. I'll have to look that up. What was it called again that you said? Uh, the Winchester Mystery House. Winchester Mystery House. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> I, I guess kind of similar. Mine was at a at an estate, <laughs> but very different in tone. But it, the yeah. general concept was just. Like, hey, there's a rich dude. He gets invited to a party. So he goes and arrives at the party. And then we have the, <laughs> the meeting between the owner of the estate 
and the guy who was invited. These were fun. Working in values uh, was starting to finally click, thanks to, um, we'll go into detail possibly later, when Kenny made us do 100 film studies in a week. <laughs> totally nonsensical. Right. These were the <laughs> finals no for the Star Guardians. I, I ended up going with, oh, I can't zoom in for some reason. Open in new tab, please. So I ended up revising the shots a little bit so that instead of them just running to a hill or a mountain, I put them more of an actual like main street with a chapel and buildings that looked like they could possibly be occupied. And rather than finding a comet in a forest, we now discover that um, that comet was a star guardian herself at a star altar. And so this one was heavily doctored, thanks to Kenny. He did some crazy design revisions to help flesh this out and got some good feedback from Kaysen and Norris. I think I'm going to have to go in and just add some more ambient light to all of these places so that you can see past the dark areas. I got a little too focused on value grouping. But overall, it was uh, I felt like these were some of the best yet that I've managed to do. <laughs> And pretty proud yeah. of him. Oh, and by the way, I got word from Kenny that he will be arriving to chat with us. Ah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh. So don't get nervous. I, I know that definitely you and Jessica uh, both pushed me to do well in class for sure, because I knew you guys were going to bring it every week. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, gosh, if those guys are going to be on point and be bringing it, you know, I got I to gotta make sure my game is is up to stuff too. So it was kind of cool to have that camaraderie in class of, uh, you know, excited to see what other people were doing. Um, and, and no, it, it did help me push myself, I think so. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing about um, just having be, being in a class in general, mm -hmm. um, because when, like when you're just teaching yourself and you're just um, kind of like, following curriculum but you're like the only student in your yeah. uh, in your um at home classroom right um, it's it's just you you don't you can't really see what other people are doing because sometimes what other people do is completely different than what you yourself would normally do right and they're also always there to like help help encourage you whenever mm -hmm. um you know you you feel stuck or something um Oh, ho, ho, ho. Hey, look who it is. It's the big man yeah. himself. I'm not that big. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we haven't met you, so we don't know. <laughs> How you doing, Kenny? <clears throat> you guys hear me? You guys hear me good? Yeah. Yeah. You're coming in all clear. Sweet, sweet. It's been a few weeks awesome. since we got to sit down and chat with you. Yeah. How's it going? It is going well. We good, just man. finished uh, wasting time and talking for about an hour and a half now. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> I've been holding him hostage. It was technical difficulties for the first half hour. And the, <laughs> we did just finish uh, going over our thoughts of the class and trashing you and going over our finals. Damn, I should have came. I should have came earlier. <laughs> you were defenseless, man. It was brutal. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was all good things. We basically just kind of talked about um, our mostly we just we focused on the finals, like kind of how we came to our conclusions. So, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'm glad you guys liked it. I guess I hope, unless unless those reviews uh, for for brainstorm look pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Are we able to leave reviews on the brainstorm site? Uh, no. Uh, you remember that uh, the survey? The, the survey. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I left you like a heartfelt message. Oh, I don't. I don't read any of those. So <laughs> wonderful. It's nice to know that like James higher up, like reading it from heaven or something and just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're all sitting there giggling like, oh, should we show up? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if yeah, you want like to take the time just to introduce yourself, Kenny, for it's not like there's going to be many people who see this, but for those who may not know who you are. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I guess I'll just do the full introduction. Hi, my name is Kenny Vo. Uh, I am a vis de uh, visual development artist at Netflix. Um, you know, I've been uh, you know working in the entertainment industry for uh, I guess five years now. Wow, fast! 
Jeez. Uh, yeah, I've you know done things from uh, movies, games, uh, TV, theme park, uh, all the above. Every all styles from like stylites, Hearthstone to photo real Call of Duty, and yeah. The range is specifically what drew me to picking your class because I, I checked out your art mm-hmm. station and I thought, man, this guy can do everything. It's like, <laughs> it's really cool to see. And I know that you've spoken about being pushed like that by uh, James Peck, who you worked with for some time. You you and Kaysen, like I was t- uh, telling Brian and Jessica earlier because we were looking at his art station, just the amount of range that you guys demonstrate mm. is yeah really impressive. You know, it, it's crazy because it's like well, when you first start, like you know, you, there, there's that look that you're kind of you can you have right, um, and then once once a job comes in that's like out of your comfort zone, you know, you you either one pray that you don't get it or you know, <laughs> two you 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 got to figure out how to swim. So it, it's. It's, it was a big learning experience getting to that point, right? Because we'd be doing like photo bashing and like high photo real concept art. And then out of nowhere, he'd be like, oh, hey, can you guys do this super stylized uh, piece for Blizzard? And we're like, uh, sure. You know, and, you know, we, we the first couple of times that, that that would happen, you know, you get hammered. He makes you like learn your process better and, and analyze and break things down and uh, really get good at reference gathering and understanding your material before you start. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after so many rounds of that, it's just, it, it, I guess, I don't want to say it's easy, but it gets to a point to where you understand like how to branch off and where, right? Like in your process, when do you go from stylized to photo reel to whatever, you know? Right. That was, that was the biggest yeah. thing that you had taught us in class, which was process. And yeah, I can I can tell you right now in the weeks since we've adjourned, I guess, like that has been the most noticeable thing that uh, Mm -hmm. I've gained getting out of it is the efficiency that you built in into us. Yeah, like it's 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 getting more ingrained, like I I can tell that I'm getting more effective and the stuff that I could accomplish in a few hours when it otherwise would have taken maybe at least a day beforehand. Dude, that's great, man. You know, yeah, it's it's crazy because like, you know, as a student, I remember my my biggest goal, right? Like just when I was learning how to just be a concept artist was like make a good image, right? Just one, just the assignment is this, just do one, right? But whenever you actually get to start working, uh, it's very rare that you only get one painting, right? It's it's the whole area. It's the it's the 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 mass of thumbnails. Like I think me and uh, me and a coworker Aaron, we did like I think a hundred and thirty thumbnails for a project at one point. Whoa. We were we were going in every day for I think like three months to three to six months, and just cranking out uh, you know five five paintings a day. Sometimes six, you know, sometimes three, but. This was at, job, at, at the peak, of, yeah, this is for a job. And uh, at the peak of that, I was doing nine, nine paintings a day, and it, it it was it was crazy because that's when my process really clicked. Right, like it didn't matter what I was doing, it didn't matter what the topic was. It was literally like it just became like clockwork, you know. And whenever your process kicks in like that, it's it's like life changing, you know. It, you start seeing art differently, but uh, if you don't think about your process at all for the whole painting, it's things that things like that will never happen, right? Because you're not doing the same process, and you're you, you might be guessing, you know, you might be uh, doing something new every time, which is which is good for personal work. But when you know when you're on the job and you need to, you need to make sure that you need you deliver something, you know, you need to have something that you can rely on. Man, it's I was watching a YouTube video by uh, Stephen Sabata, and he was. Mm-hmm talking about see if i can find it what it takes to become a professional artist and it's just he he does a lot of kind of psychological approaches to the journey and kind of the war of attrition that it takes to become an artist and Mm -hmm. towards the end of the video he talks about how artists are uh, freaks or because 
in order to be at the top of a game to to invest so much time the amount of effort and efficiency and the kind of personality that it takes to to do that self selects for a very specific kind of person and so yeah. he he ended the video with a challenge saying this is just my sketchbook and this is what i do for fun this is my comfort zone um i don't i haven't shown you what i do for work but if you feel like you want to be in here you've got to get comfortable and really be true to yourself like can you do what i am doing and i'll see you there mm -hmm. and that really yeah. powerful ending but it i think what he does is slightly different from you but his process of working traditionally extends to how he approaches digital and you can really tell yeah. that he's got that nailed down and he can just sit there for hours and pump things out endlessly yeah, it, it, you're 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 not you're not struggling with the medium anymore. You know, you're you're not thinking like, oh, does this painting look good or is this value structure right? It's like, no, you're just you're just talking on a canvas, right? You just you're just putting out ideas at that point. Like at some point, you start forgetting about perspective, about value groupings, about color theory, and all that. And you're just you're just going, you know. And if you have all of your kind of tools in a line. Um, it can kind of, it makes things a lot easier and kind of gets you into that flow a lot quicker. Like you ever like break something down, like in terms of like trying to fix something and then you're like, oh, I need a screwdriver and you, you run out and go get a screwdriver. It's like, oh, I need the socket wrench. So you run back out and go get that socket wrench and all that running back and forth kind of takes you out of that zone of fixing. But if you take all your, bring all your tools with you and get everything set up and kind of plan through your shot and have what you need, you know, it. It's, it just becomes easy because you have everything right there waiting for you. And it's the same same idea behind it, like the asset sheet that I was talking about, setting up the value groupings uh, and having very specific phases that you're doing things in. Yeah, absolutely. Would you consider these assets or more prop designs here on the screen of your project? Uh, actually, I can't even. Are you? Sh am I? I'm, I think I'm sharing. Am I? Brian or Jessica? Yeah, you are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you'll have I... to click on Alex's name. On oh, the... there you go. I swear, man, Discord's so... sharing UI makes zero sense. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Nice. Yeah, so those uh, those are props, right? Like, so everything you're seeing there is props. That's something that I wouldn't have as an asset sheet. I would have those. I you know I would make those using the asset sheet. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. Confirming. Like those right there. I go down. Those with little bit less i guess refinement not that it's super refined but so the, the way i started this project was i i just started creating just facades just trying to get a language down right uh, egyptian water water wheel and just trying to just trying to put in the main kind of elements and then if you go to one of the uh, keyframe paintings up top that one right there if you zoom into like some of the pieces you can see like the things that i just put in perspective you know, like it's the wall elements right there. It's all flat, you know, with a little bit of indication of lighting. But it just, it gets you close enough to where you can either one, fake the illusion, or two, you just need to add just a little bit of love and you're, you're, you're already there, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like you said that you start to see art differently. It's, it's now I'm thinking, okay, how can I save time on this? <laughs> that's, that's the first yeah. thing that I'm thinking. Uh, how, what what can I do so that I don't have to really work at this? And mm -hmm. it's effective. It it you can you can spend more time getting the piece done, getting one piece good and copying it over, it builds into a whole. Yeah. That was like a huge, huge, huge tip when you were uh, helping with one of my projects towards the end. It wasn't even like a super particularly hard form language or anything but you just took the star that i had already built in here and like okay let's just copy and paste that around and just let's take these spires and then duplicate that over and when you start to just uh, kind of add repetition it builds a form language and without any additional work on your own part that was really yeah good. you know you're just you're just stitching things together you know and it, it, i thought the cohesion <laughs> that it builds <laughs> it makes it look like you thought things through <laughs> oh yeah. When in reality, you could just be <laughs> stamping things around. Oh yeah, dude. That's that's all it is, man. They're like, oh, did you design all this? I'm like, hell yeah, I did. You know, but most <laughs> of it's happy accidents that I just kind of stamped around. Like that piece, 
Uh, that's all still like when you really look at it now, you're like, oh, that's just a silhouette that he grabbed a bunch of like half of it doesn't even make sense. It was one of the earlier paintings that just happened to stick. And, you know, you can see all the very different pieces. And then all, all you got to do is just add like a couple things here and there to make it make sense. You know, God dang. Ken. Yeah. This is like the first time I've zoomed in on this. And like, this is just another <laughs> building put in front of this building. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very effective, especially at a at a distance. You're like, wow, that is impressive to look at. And, and you know, that's the whole point. Like understanding what phase you are in, right? Like more often than not, you know, you get you get these scenarios where you're you're painting a thumbnail, right? But you're like figuring out every little thing, and it doesn't need to be figured out. A lot of it can be left to the imagination, and uh, it's more often than not better, right? Oh, this one's a fun one. This is this was when I started figuring it out. <clears throat> so if you scroll down to that second one, yeah, uh, that one I painted by hand, every single piece, right? Whoa. And because I didn't quite understand my process yet, I didn't really know. Uh, so all the architecture, I kind of painstakingly went in there, and uh, well, the, the round you're seeing right now is the better version. Uh, but um, once I I turned it in. And James was like, dude, none of this is consistent, man. Like all the spires don't have the same amount of spikes. The the pillars don't make sense. And, you know, they're, it's not mirroring. It's architecture. It needs to it needs to duplicate, you know? Wow. And then he just showed me like one part of it. He just did a quick thing. I was like, oh, my God. And then it changed everything. <laughs> what a way to find out. <laughs> like, dude, your piece sucks. Yeah. And then he shows you in two seconds. Yeah, because, you know, architecture is scary because... Um, oh, there's all those repeating columns. There's all that molding. There's all that, you know, little things here and there, right? Um, but once you learn how to use assets and understand like a good process to kind of get that down, right? Architecture is one of the easiest things because it's repeated elements. So you really only got to paint like one window, one pillar, and you can do an entire castle, you know, with like, you know, just a couple roofs here and there. Yeah. It's so funny, like you said, too, how sometimes it's just it's just one tip or just one like, oh, yeah, just do this. And then it's like click, you know, everything starts to make sense. And yeah. it, it might not be new information that you haven't heard before, but just the way that somebody explained it or showed it, you know, all of a sudden you're like, uh, oh, <laughs> I get it now. I get it now. I'm, you know, to be to be honest, I'm still doing that to this day, like. Um, you know, you, you hear things in, in school and I guess there's the idea that, you know, you, you, you hear it, right. You're, you, you're understanding what they're telling you, but you're not right. ready for it. Right. Right. And there's, there's days where I'm sitting there, I'm painting, I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, boom, there you go. Like that was it. You know, that's what they were trying to tell me all those years yes. ago. Right. But you know, you're just not at the level to where you're ready to hear that yet. You know? Yeah. You're like still processing it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, is this funny? I don't know. The, the interesting thing about world building, too, is that you kind of get a weird mix of students in the sense that there's the students that are learning how to take a line drawing to a painting. And there's those that are learning how to world build, but they know how to paint or at least have a decent understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's the ones that are learning how to paint that can't quite grasp that asset sheet yet, you know, because it's just the idea of turning form, light side, shadow side, uh, reflective light, you know, just getting the basics down. That's, that's already hard enough. Right. Yeah. But once, once you know that, then you can start using these, these, these building blocks, these Lego pieces to really kind of like jumpstart your, your, I guess your learning, you know? So is it, is it kind of hard to be prepared for all, I guess, ability levels like that when you're teaching a class like being, uh, you almost have to te do you have to teach differently depending on what people are able to do yeah i mean i i'm relatively new to teaching a group of people uh you know i'm used to doing mentorships to where i can literally stop the class and be like hey we need to work on this right right um uh, but yeah with with a live class it's a lot harder you can't in my in my experience you can't just pause the whole class and I have to I have to kind of gauge how how people do in the homework because like okay let's say let's say one person missed the mark by a mile right but mm -hmm. you know nine out of nine of nine out of ten students understood it completely it's like okay that probably wasn't me right 
they, they're just <laughs> not ready for that information. But whenever like nine out of 10 miss it completely, they're like, they all got it wrong. It's like, oh, okay. I think I said something weird that they didn't quite understand. I need to reassess that, you know? I need to dial it back some or, yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I'm, I'm still kind of learning that. You know, every class that I, that I teach, it's uh, a new learning experience for me to be like, okay, the last class didn't get this, so how can I address that? You know, and I did that with you guys. I did that with the class before, and it's a couple, a couple more rounds, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll have a better understanding. <laughs> nah, nah, man, it, it, it was a great class. class so. oh, I'm sorry. What's up? How do you think you that you'll adjust your class for the next term? Is there a um, changes you plan to make? Yeah, so I think doing the demos, right? I would start a new demo every week, but there was one week in particular that I didn't. I grabbed the last week's painting and I and I, I took it into that uh, lighting and texture pass. Um, it was that castle one, mm-hmm. and I feel like a lot like for you guys, it made a lot more sense, right? Something I don't know. I felt like something clicked that week. Maybe, maybe it just happened to be that week four, but something clicked to where everybody got it. So I think this coming class, what I'm going to do is for the first week, you know, do thumbnails next week, take that, take those set of thumbnails and take one of those to the next level and then take, you know, and basically do an entire painting throughout the demos of the class. That sounds and it's like just, a great idea. Yeah. Just a one painting, you know, that way you can clearly see where I came from, you know, instead of like, cause I'll, I will, what I was doing was I would kind of burn through that initial kind of blockout section that we covered last week. And then I would be like, okay, this is where the demo starts, but you, you know, you lose time and you lose, uh, you, you might lose some people, you know, they might get like locked on the wrong thing or something. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I do think nice. ideally people in WB2 are at an intermediate stage and in trying to mm-hmm. get pushed to advance so that they're ready for, WB three or something else. And halfway through the yeah. term, we, we are capable of at least keeping up with that initial, that initial stage of laying in the groundwork. And then it's, it's pushing past all of the roadblocks to get beyond that. That becomes really challenging. Yeah. yeah. I did want to ask you, I've got um, this project crystal born heroes of fate and a lot mm-hmm. of this is icons and props. And I think that's often an unsung hero of concept art that people don't really want to face the music for, right? Would you say it's a pretty important aspect of the job that um, focusing on individual prop designs and a lot of the more mon- mundane filling in assets, that's a pretty big part of the job, right? Oh yeah. No, that's the, that's one of the biggest aspects of the job. Like, you know, it's props is like, Oh, that's leave that to the junior or whatever, you know, but at the end of the day, everyone's doing props, right? There's only so many keyframe paintings. Like, you know, there's like, there's like 20 pages there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, you know, roughly, uh, there's like three keyframes and then the rest (laughs) is pages and pages of icons and props, right? There's like one, two, three, yeah, three total. And then there's like 10 icons on one page alone, you know, and it's just like the amount of work, especially for that project specifically, it was a mobile game um, where it was very icon heavy and very, uh, you know, because whenever you're playing a game, especially a mobile game, it's a lot of UI plus 2D asset icons, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a majority of the game. And then the loading screen was like the keyframe or, you know, very select things here and there, but this, this stuff is the goal. That's where, that's what they need. So if you can boost up your portfolio and show them like, Hey, I, I can do what you need me to do because when you get hired onto a studio, this is what they need you to do. Uh, the keyframes are cool, but they probably already have a guy that can do it. Yeah. Um, especially at a, on an entry level position, like this is the stuff that they're looking for. Can you do a prop? Can you do it well? Um, and can you communicate ideas and, and, and do things for a production rather than, you know, making cool paintings to be cool, you know? Looks yeah. like it would be really good to be well-versed in different sorts of materials, material rendering, getting that polished mobile look. 
Oh yeah. You know, like getting, at least uh, learning how to indicate materials. It doesn't have to be like photo real materials, but understanding the, the core fundamentals of materials, uh, mm-hmm. you know, how to make things shiny, how to th- make things matte, how to make things clear, you know? So, yeah, this one's a great, great portfolio. You know, I also, yeah. I was, I was wanting to talk to you also, cause I was listening to the art cafe podcast. That's a uh, Mache. Uh, Kuchiara's his his podcast and he Mm -hmm. had Jason Jason Shire on a few months Mm -hmm. ago Jason Shire has been your art director with your current production designer production designer thank you at Netflix and I he's he mentioned on the podcast that he said we are not going to believe the sorts of projects that Netflix has in the pipeline for the next three years or so that they've been kind of <laughs> restructuring f- for quality and putting an emphasis on uh, like creator owned ideas, I guess. And mm-hmm. the, the kind of talent pool that Netflix has been collecting is really exciting to him. And mm-hmm. I know there's not a ton that you can share, but I was wondering if you had anything to share about uh, is business is booming in animation right now or job opportunities or even just if you're excited about the kinds of things you've been seeing at Netflix. Yeah. You know, I, I, I totally, totally agree with what Jason was saying. Where like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of high end talent at Netflix. Like some of the, some of the, uh, the, the people that I look up to and some of the, 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 I guess the better artists in the industry are there now, you know, um, I obviously their projects haven't been named. So I don't, I don't want to put, you know, dropping any names out, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's so many teams like, you know, uh, the team that I'm on, you know, we're just one. And since everything's uh, at work at home right now, COVID, uh, I actually don't get a, a strong idea of how many teams there are. Cause you know, you're just interacting with your own, you know? Right. Uh, but seeing like little snippets from the, uh, the emails they'll give us and stuff like that. It's, it's insane how many different projects are going on and how many of those have some super high end artists on them. And you know, I, I'm super excited to see, see what, what, what they make and what uh, kind of Netflix kind of brings out. Cause I think for me, it's really exciting to see them not only hire on so many uh, strong, like, amazing designers, but also just how much freedom that each project or how, I guess this design wise and style wise, like how, how wild some of these designs and stuff are able to get. Right. I think between like maybe the, the four projects that I've seen, not like in depth or anything, but sure. it's the styles are, are, are vastly different. And for me, that's so cool because that's, that's pushing the, pushing the boundaries of, of animation. That's so exciting to hear because, you know, in the yeah. at least in Western animation, there's been a big stigma around, I guess, investments, green lighting stuff that is really at the most family friendly, if not yeah. kind of more oriented towards kids. We've had Disney and Pixar yeah. kind of set that precedent for decades now. And only recently have you seen like uh, Sony has kind of started to figure it out. Spider-Verse. And some of the newer projects that they've announced, Netflix has already put out what uh, Love, Death, and Robots. That was Albert, Alberto <laughs> Mielgo did the one of the episodes on there. Yeah, the third one, Witness. Yes, yeah, that one. And Klaus with Spa Studios. That I imagine that if they were trying to pitch that idea to some other distributor, it might not have been picked up on if it weren't for the like the streaming wars that have been going on. So yeah. It's, it's cool you know, it's, to think about the styles that we were going to be able to do going forward just to find variety to, you know, to target a niche. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things that like, I felt up until shit, maybe like spider verse mm-hmm. things got very stale, right? Things were like, how real can we, can we make this look right? Look at that water effect look at that snow effect right i don't want to name names but you know. <laughs> i don't know what you're like, talking about yeah it's right. it's how real can we make this thing look and then spider-verse comes in and is like oh we're not making any of this look real right there's a obviously there's a 
there's the, the lighting and the mood and the environments look, uh, I guess, on a, on, a, on a thumbnail, have a very re- realistic lighting sense. But the graphic nature and, and things that they pushed was so, like, it was life-changing for me, at least. I was like, man, that's, that's, what, could, that's what you can do with this, you know? And ever since then, I've just been looking for projects or looking for, for, for movies and stuff that, that do that. Because for me, that's what animation is, right? It's doing what live action can. And whenever you're trying to replicate realism, it's like, well, why don't we just shoot that on an actual camera, you know? Do you, you said that you're trying to look for that now, as in, like, are you trying to target jobs that you think might end up being more creatively different or just trying to pit, trying to find entertainment that you like both you know whenever, whenever like uh, obviously i'm not looking right now but like whenever i was looking for studio work um that was a big consideration right like is your project something that is actually cool or is it actually doing something or is it more of the same right um, are you able to find that out are you is i guess i guess like with jason he pulled you onto the team, so he may have shared some details about what you were going to be working on, asking if you were yeah. interested in doing it. You know, like uh, when, I, like when I when I was initially talking to Jason, uh, they they kind of sh- uh, you know after after some NDAs and all that stuff, um, they showed me some of the work that they're doing and uh, you know some of the ideas that they had, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. I'm you know I would love to be a part of this because they're doing something that uh, I feel hasn't been done, or at the very least isn't done very much, you know? Mm. And uh, for me, that's just exciting, right? Doing something that uh, pushes the needle a bit more, you know? Yeah, because I, I've been a little concerned about that, but starting to rest easy, um, Brian and Jessica and I, we've we've gone through and we've made goal folders. I think nice. you guys have. Yeah. And basically, Winton looked up all of our favorite artwork online and determined like, where do we want to work? Where do we want to go going forward as, as individuals? And so Mm -hmm. when I was doing it, I found that, well, I I do want to work in visual development, but um, I don't want to do Disney Pixar kind of look. I I, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be happy to work on a project. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. (laughs) Um, It's specifically kind of like the high, the rendering is kind of hyper realism or um, maybe if you're doing the props, it's kind of cutesy in that kind of realm. Mm-hmm. Whereas semi-realism or abstraction with shapes like Spider-Verse tries to push is more exciting to me. And I, I would kind of hope yeah. to be able to find projects like that. And you seem to have been able to. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a lot of luck too, you know, because when Spider-Verse came out and you watch it in the theaters, you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. But that project started four years ago or three years ago, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> you know, you missed the boat. If you're sitting in the theater watching it, you missed the boat. <laughs> um, so you kind of have to like luck into a project like that uh, or at least know people, know enough people in the industry to kind of be like, oh, hey, what are you working on? You know, it's like, and they can kind of like kind of guide you that way. So it's it's tough. I There's no... I, at least for me, I don't know anybody that that can just tell me like, oh, hey, go over there, you know, but uh, right. yeah, this this stuff is awesome. I think Sergio or someone is the actual like founder or owner of Spa Studios. I thought it was Sergio Mancinelli. Yeah. What is it? Sergio Pablo's Pablo? animation. Let's look him up. Yeah, it's his initials. SPA is his or SP is his initials. OK, so it is Mancinelli is his last name, but Pablo is his middle name. Oh, okay. Maybe? As I'm guessing. So yeah, I, no I do idea. really hope that we get to see <laughs> more projects like that going forward. I was I was encouraged by, you know, seeing um the new Dota animation that came out. And oh, I didn't uh, see that. It was um Studio Mir is the, the animation studio that made Korra, Legend of Korra. Yeah, yeah. And they worked on Dota, a Defense of the Ancients, and it was good. It was I, I would expect nothing less of them because they do magic with so nope. little. And then um, the recent Invincible on Amazon. It's been... Oh, that one's brutal, man. Yeah. Been, yeah. Really like, I've, seen, I've seen a couple. You watched it's, a couple uh, it, does, it doesn't shy away. Dude, 
I when when I heard that the show was getting uh, made, so like when they first announced that they were doing it, I thought, oh, okay, well, I better start getting into reading it. And I finally picked it up again in earnest, and I'm now uh, 95 issues deep into the actual book, and I've been staying up late each night. It gets crazy. Uh, nice. Uh, Robert Kirkman, the, the author, I think he said he wants to get seven seasons done if Amazon will greenlight it. And Holy cow. I, uh, you know, it's blowing up right now um, and everyone was sharing stuff. And then it, it popped up on my YouTube recommended. It was one of the fights. And, you know, it looked like a, a cool 2D superhero animation. You know, I was expecting like Justice League or, you know, like animation like that. Mm hmm. And he just obliterates people. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah, it's like Especially, eyeballs popping out and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, it does look like it's straight out of um, the DC animation team. It's been yeah, similar. it just it just caught me by surprise. I know I've already I haven't yeah. heard Jessica speak up in a while. I'm thinking maybe she fell asleep. I'm not asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just enjoying the conversation yeah. <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say um, one thing that I definitely picked up after by the time the class was done, which was really cool, is I didn't feel like I had as many questions, especially about process and how to approach things. Like I feel way more confident now about just jumping in to doing a drawing or a painting or coming up with my ideas. Mm -hmm. And and that was something I didn't really notice until like a week or two after class where it was like, you know what, I I'm in a place now where almost like you said, I'm thinking less about the tools. Um, yeah. How am I going to do this? What am I going to use? What brush should I use? You know, it was more like, oh, I have this idea. You know, I know how to do a little composition study for it. I know how to look for references for it. And now I, I got into more of a mode where I can just do the work. And what's interesting, too, is like. I, I wasn't necessarily I'm no longer interested in in having a perfect result every time. Like you're saying, like, like, oh, not everything needs to be like a beautiful painting. For me, it was just the act of completing it. Like if I can just get my idea out there, I know that I can I can work it up. I can change it. I can, you know, fix it as I go. But the important thing is just to complete it, just to get it down. And mm -hmm. And just trying to do that every day. Like it was more important to me now to complete something every day, even if it's something small and build up that, that process. Almost like how you said you had that trial by fire where you were doing like, you know, a couple paintings a day and then five paintings a day. And then before you know it, you were doing 10 paintings a day because you were just slowly refining. You knew how to approach it and you were refining that, refining that, refining that. And I think that's something I definitely picked up from you during class was the ability of knowing how to approach solving problems yeah 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 that's a big thing like you know you always think not you specifically just in general um yeah. you you have to have the full idea right then and there right like when you start yeah. this painting, when you start your sketch every idea needs to be there for me i just need the general idea right because once once i get that out of the way then on my second phase or you know as i'm kind of moving through it that's when you start kind of refining the idea. You, you start adding things. You kind of work on the fly like that. It's For me, it's less stressful because have, trying to have a full idea right off the bat is like scary because it's like, dude, you have to fully think through this thing that has you know, an immense amount of thought and depth in one try. It's like, that. no, that's, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Like you said, phases, that really, that really clicked for me when I was like, if I know what my intent is when I sit down to do it, like you said, I'm, I'm only in the brainstorming or I'm only trying to, you know, figure out my shapes and my forms, or I'm just working on a value stage. Uh, yeah. It's way easier to complete it because then it's like bite-sized problems. <laughs> like you said, instead yeah. of trying to complete like a whole image in one sitting, like I'm going to sit down and I'm going to Craig Mullins the shit out of this. And it's going to be amazing. It's like, no, like now I just know to solve one problem at a time and build those things up. And, so yeah, thank you. That was that was an awesome lesson I picked up in class, and that that really helped me a lot. Nice. Yeah, no, I'm glad it helped. I don't know. No, I was just gonna say a lot of these things were just things that I had to either either experience the hard way or kind of figure out as I went, and you know, just trying to condense that down. And I'm glad you guys are like at, at the very least understanding it and able to pick it up. So that's good. 
is that pretty cool to to hear students after the fact come back to you and tell you, Kenny, thank you, you're amazing. <laughs> the, Dude, hundred percent, man. Like, you know, because like every, like of, of the of everything that I'll say, right? Uh, my my hope is you pick up thirty percent, right? Just just pick up just something. Just yeah. everybody, everybody pick up something from what I said, and hopefully that kind of pushes you into that next level. That way. You know, you're you're at another level to where you can understand more things, right? And the better you get, the more you're gonna pick up. But my whole goal is just just one thing. Just if you can take that one thing and move on, I don't even care, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I do think that um, me me and Alex especially kind of lucked out by taking Kason and then your class because you guys are so similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back to back, and I really did seem like a continuation of what he was. You could tell you guys had the same kind of way of thinking and working because, you know, it really did kind of pick off where he left off and carry on to you. Um, so I, I feel fortunate that that worked out for us. <laughs> it must be. Yeah, that's a by fire under James. Yeah, that's a weird. That's a weird quirk of uh, of of me and Case and teaching at the same school because, and then on top of that, teaching the same series. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, cause if, I, if I tell like, you know, 81 or something, you, you know, it wouldn't be as I mean, I'm sure it would, but not as connected. Right. But right. since it's world building one to world building two and he paints uh, process wise, he paints this exact same way I do literally down to the layering style. The only difference is the, the execution, right? The 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 fidelity and the finish that he puts on or or, or that I put on. Right. That, that right. makes it kind of unique. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we learn from the same guy and, and these things are tried and true methods. These aren't things that we're, ma- I, I didn't make any of this up, you know? Right. Right. right, I'm, right. Just, I'm just repeating it. Yeah. Carrying on the tradition, really. Yeah. <laughs> A huge part of um, the classes with you and Kaysen has been, like Brian was saying, just like the amount of volume that you have us do, which crazy, but it really allows you to treat um, each thing is kind of a, a throwaway, like you have a goal and you're going to get there as fast as possible because you have 90 other things that you need to do right? by the end of the week. And I'm sure that that was like a trial by fire working at Scribblepad or, or under James where he's just a madman and you, you kind of, <laughs> it kind of rubs off on you. So we're like third hand experiencing uh, James's <laughs> influence. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like, it's one of those things where because he's so fast, I don't know, maybe maybe his sense of time is, is messed up because he'd be like, what's taking you so long? I'm like, dude, I got this earlier today. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> right. But in, in his mind, he'd be done already. And because, uh, you know, there's a schedule to kind of keep or, you know, he, he has plans for us in terms of moving on to the next assignment or whatever. And, you know, you, you start trying to meet that expectation or, I mean, you have to, at the end of the day, it's, it's your, it's your job to meet that expectation. Um, but I think for me, it was just something that you, you just need to do it because at the end of the day, especially me as, as lead at the studio, I was essentially the last line of defense. If I don't get this out, there's nobody behind me to, to do it. You know, because, you know, I'm the one to that that needs to to carry this project or, you know, um, I need to be the quality bar at the studio. So it's just one of those things that you you either, you know, sink or swim, right? Right. What would happen if I'm sure, you know, realistically, you would be up front with James in the moment that, dude, I'm in over my head. I need your help to to finish this deadline. Did that ever happen or would you just put in the time? and power through it until you were able to. to yeah. To no, that happens all the time, dude, all the time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things that you, you kind of just keep, you kind of keep pushing that line. Right. And you try to figure out where that, where, where that limit for yourself is. And eventually you're going to hit it. And, um, but the, the thing, the thing about our studio was that uh, we needed to be honest about that and understand that you're at that limit, know your limits. Don't just, don't just kind of cower away in a corner and kind of hide until you get yelled at, you know, just speak up, be like, Hey, I need some help. Uh, I think I'm messing up. Something's wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
uh, hopefully we can address it before the assignments do rather than, oh, now the assignments do. And now you're coming up to us saying that you can't do it, you know? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so it's about, yeah. And that's happened before too. And it's, it's never, it's never a fun experience, but uh, the biggest thing for us was communication, right? Communicate that you're struggling, communicate that you don't, uh, you don't know what to do next. I think, <clears throat> I think it was uh, Jessica that, that uh, I think it was week nine or whatever, where she was like, I don't know where else to take this. And that's the kind of things that I want to hear because that's why you're taking class classes, right? Right. Because you don't know how to, what way to take it. And that's why I'm here because you know, we, we, I can give you that, that push or that, that next step that can kind of make, make everything click. And uh, seeing the finals that, uh, that, that she submitted, I was like, damn, that, no, it really clicked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That one right there. I was like, wow. Well, one thing's for sure. When I sat in <laughs> to see your Alex's piece, that's what it clicked. Nice. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I'll go over that real quick. But um, Kenny, I really appreciate you taking the time af- outside of class to hang out with us, with, with your students, and give us the pointers that we needed to really kind of make some things click. I That one-on-one session that we had in week nine made everything come together. That was the pivotal moment of the entire class where some of the things that we talked about finally hit home and reality sank in. And I thought, Oh my God, this all makes sense. Um, nice. That's, uh, that was really, really cool of you to do to just hang out for a couple of hours and, and show mm-hmm. us like, here's how I would operate and unobstructed by the constraints of the class time too. And, yeah, that did that. That was tough, right? Uh, it it was hard because you know there's so many people in the class, and you know giving you ten minutes is still a lot, like probably more than I should be giving in class because you got to balance like the lecture plus other student crits, and you know I can't just go in there and figure things out. I I, I have to the way I was doing it was kind of like this is how I figure it out. Not this is me figuring it out, but it was that, that, that sit down session that we had where I was actually figuring it out. I just sat down and was like, okay, you know, just do as if it was my own painting. Mm -hmm. And this is where I would take it. I think uh, something there clicked and I, uh, it should actually uh, happen during the class. So I I need to, you know, I need to be better on, on my end about that. But uh, you know, at the very least, I'm glad it clicked. (laughs) You know, I've I've been slowly working through some of the midterms and I'm getting to my finals now, uh, putting on those final extra critique touches that Kaysen and Norris had given us. And mm-hmm. uh, they are definitely helping. Like I, I was able to put some light on this third image because they got totally lost and I adjusted the value staging of the inside of the barn some so you can actually see the dead bodies hanging. And mm-hmm. I'll be excited to, I've really appreciated that about Brainstorm is how like um, personal the connections we've been making with you guys have been. Yeah. And I, I do feel like I can reach out to Kaysen or or even Norris, even having only spoke to him in passing and just say, hey, uh, I did what you told me and I hope that it's cool this time. So I just wanted to let you know. And I, I feel like they'd be receptive to that and uh I, I I enjoy that particular aspect of brainstorm. Nice, yeah, dude. You know, uh, you know, brainstorm is a uh, well before before the pandemic, it was a in person like s- situation or school. And for me, I I personally like that the most, right? Because you're actually looking at somebody, you're you're hanging out with people, you know, you're meeting your teacher, you're understanding them, and. You know, there's breaks in the middle of class or even before class. You're you're able to kind of chat with the teacher and, and kind of understand them a little better. And they're able to understand you a little better. And I think for me, that was very, very important, right? Almost more important than the actual class, to be completely honest. Uh-huh. And me, like, just trying to be there outside of class was 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 a big part of that. Just making sure that that connection is still being built, right? Because I know it can be 
very hard as a student to, uh, it, it, you can feel really lost, right? If you don't have somebody that you can trust giving you good information, you know, or, or feel like you have all these questions that you can't ask, you know, because, oh, you know, I don't, I don't want to waste his time or I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I, I know they're busy or I don't want to seem like a fanboy or anything, you know, I, I just want it to be like, hey, anything you got, just, just send it my way and I'll answer to the best I can or I'll find somebody that can answer it, you know, mm-hmm. because those things are important. You know, it's not knowing where to go and that can literally cut years off of your learning experience, right? Just having the right answer just a little bit earlier, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Kenny, I'm your fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been curious to ask this to all of the people that I have conversations with. Uh, does it ever get tiring <clears throat> to get to talk about art <laughs> on repeat? I'm sure you you get asked these questions pretty frequently. You know, I don't actually talk about art that much. Um, You know, yeah, I mean, I work in a studio that we're doing art, but we're not talking about art, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, there's the crit for sure. But then there's also a lot of like just talking shit and, you know, just hanging out and being people, you know, like. Right. Once you get to, once you're in, like once you're working, um, I'm not talking to my coworker about perspective or I'm not talking to them about, you know, story moments and beats and stuff outside of, you know, the assignment. So it's, it's kind of fun in, in my, in my experience talking with students, because there's a lot of things that I see that I was doing that, uh, I just wish that, Oh, you know, maybe, uh, I wish I had someone to tell me that whenever I was starting or, or there's questions that, that you'll bring up or whoever I'm like, Oh wow. Yeah, that's right that is a problem I ran into that I forgot about, you know, and I just, it's, it's nice being able to help and streamline that process. So. Yeah. I, I do but, think it's very rewarding to be a teacher. When it clicks, dude, it's the best. Like whenever, whenever somebody like comes back the next week and something like changed and you're like, what happened? Like it was literally <laughs> seven days. <laughs> And some like, they're just a whole different artist, Right. And I think with week nine, a lot of you guys had that moment. And I was like, what happened? Holy <laughs> shit. You know, it was insane. But there's also weeks where I'm like, did I mess up? Like, I'm like <laughs> did I not explain that well enough? You know, so it, all, it can be kind of scary, but yeah. Well, when it, when it does click, it's, it's very rewarding. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I wanted to know when did you fit this in? 25 days ago was that not like immediately after oh no that was a that was a late that was a late post <clears throat> okay so the one on my instagram i don't know when when that was posted but uh yeah if you scroll down you'll see it i think you'll see it do, 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 do. you deleted uh, some posts i was trying to go back and find one of yours for referencing yeah i, I archive a lot of my work some of it i'm like i don't like that anymore and then i'll uh what is, is there a date on that September 6th. September 6th. Yeah, so that's okay. pretty old. Okay. Um, I'm really bad about up- updating my my work on like ArtStation and stuff. So I don't know. It's just like, it's a hassle. Do you draw yeah. all your yeah. figures in your scenes like this? Or do you pull in 3D models or photos and draw on top? The figures right there? Mm-hmm. And these? Uh, those were photos. Those I drew. Um, and then the ones in the previous one specifically was a photo of a dude walking across the street and all I did was uh, lasso it out and kind of repaint his clothing back on him to like make it more graphic. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it just, it just depends. Like, uh, like the figure with the Gundam right there. I did that one, the dude walking, I was being lazy. I was kind of like, it was the last thing. And I was like, I don't want to do it. But this one is like, that's the focus, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So when it's the point, like when it's the the main purpose of the scene, yeah, I'll I'll completely do it and I'll, I'll pull a lot of reference. When it's like a background person, I'm just I'm lazy, dude. <laughs> Absolutely, gotta gotta cut your corners where it makes sense. Yeah. D- did you have a bit of a character focus five and six years ago? Because then um, browsing for your art station tonight, I go back and you've got all these portraits and. You so know, pretty sophisticated style for someone who's more of a background and keyframe artist. Yeah. So that, uh, 
my feed, the, the work that I do is a reaction to the work that I'm doing at work. Um, okay. because I was in doing more, this was, uh, during some pitch work for call of duty, I believe that are around there. Um, so I was doing photo real environments. So I'm like, well, I don't want to do that when I get home. So I'll do stylized characters, you know, and I just mm-hmm. kind of flip back and forth. So if you go here, I'll even show you, if you go through the feed real quick. <clears throat> so it's all characters down there because I was mostly just doing environments. And as you go up, uh, you start seeing a lot like right that ramen shop one and the, uh, the 4th of July one, like all those, you start seeing more stylized work because the work I was doing was the, uh, the, the crystal born stuff, you know? So I started doing more graphic, more shapely stuff because they wanted more concept art stuff, you know? Yeah. That's a good, and it's just a reaction to help you prevent burnout. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing I want to do when I get home is do more of the same work. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, no, totally. You know, you're tired from work and you're like, hey, let's do more of the exact same thing. That's psychotic. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> that feeds into that feeds into what the Steven Zapata video that just the kind of people who work professionally. You work eight hours a day, you're making nine or ten paintings, and twenty icons and fifty props, and you still go home. And you put together a painting like this in your free time because uh, why not? It's just who you are. <laughs> I, I I like that aspect. I like the the environment that is created for all of these high achievers and people who are really really. It's an industry filled with intensely driven individuals. It's just exciting to think about. Yeah, it's weird. Like <clears throat> it's especially in the more mid to entry level positions, right? You get a lot of people that are super driven, right? Uh, one specific coworker of mine, uh, his name is Aaron Pinnell. Uh, he's stupidly competitive and he's annoying as hell for it. <laughs> but so is he on our- when we were at Scribble Pad, he should be. I met him actually. I met him in uh, LA a couple of times. He's a cool guy. Spelling yeah, no, he's great. No. Uh, Pinell, P-I-N-E-L. Yeah. So he, we were working together and he, he was known as the, uh, the, the young, super talented kid at brainstorm. He was, he was that kid, you know? Okay. And so he started working at scribble pad and he's just competitive, man. Like I'll do, I'll do four paintings. He's like, I did five. I'm like, God damn it. (laughs) The next day I'm like, I'll do five and then he'll do six. And then eventually we're, we're like kind of neck and neck at seven, eight, and nine. Right. They're just talking shit to each other all day, but it's that push, right? It's, yeah. uh, it's that competitiveness that kind of gets you to perform just that, just a little bit more, you know, cause when you get comfortable, you start doing the same things and you're not really progressing, you know? And I think for me, I, I guess I got lucky that there was some, there was people around uh, that do that, you know, cause not everybody is like that. But there are there are select few people that are, and if you're able to be around people like that and rise to the challenge, you know it can be I don't know very big growing potential, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this dude is a monster. Go go, Aaron! He's, Holy cow! He's like 22, <laughs> 22, 23, I think. He was 19 when he started, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> dude, like Irie Pan, she's in her first year at Art Center. And she's already gotten yeah. like five different client projects and she's teaching at the foundation Patreon. And you don't, why are you at art center still? You're already professional. Yeah. You know, so I was, I, I went to Noman before and there was always that conversation at Noman and, and or just in the art, art space in general, like, Oh, like the art center students are insane. You know, like they're doing all of this, you know, they're miles ahead of you essentially. And because for me, uh, that person was, uh, was Finian, Finian McManus and like, uh, uh, a couple other students like that. I like Leah, you and, uh, what was, what was his name? Uh, Feng, you know, you would think like, oh man, there's a whole school with students all like that. Right. But then once you actually kind of meet some of the art center students, like, oh, even then those people are like the top, like 1% of their, of their school, you know? 
Mm. So it's, right. it's, it's reassuring that there's only a couple of them, but yeah, it's, it's scary. It's sometimes like <laughs> some of the people that, that are still in school, I'm like, what, dude, you're better than I am. Like, how's that? a? How are you not working yet? Right. I was blown away. Uh, Ahmed Aldori, he had posted recently his uh, pre-art center portfolio, what he applied, what he submitted to get into the school. And it's like he it's already <laughs> like ridiculous, full, uh, detailed paintings. It Maybe it's not up to snuff for, you know, like what he might need to do for concept work in particular. But it was already like, wow, he's he's crossed a ton of barriers and he hasn't even gotten into the school yet. So yeah, that's wild. It's it's scary, man. It's like that. <clears throat> I mean, I was at brainstorm not even doing that level you know mm-hmm. shit some would say i'm not even there yet but you know it's it's one of those things where you know like i was saying in the chat the other day where you know there's these monstrous students and these these just artists that are insane right but at the end of the day um you know it's really about your ideas and how you work in a pipeline right it's not just about your ability to draw like your your ability to draw and paint is definitely important but once you get past that entry level, once you get in, um, there's so many other skills that you need to learn that makes you an effective concept artist that, uh, you know, shouldn't make you scared when, when, when you're working around people like that. Mm-hmm. At least not like job security wise. Yeah, it becomes, at least to my understanding, it becomes much more about what can you personally bring to the table rather than your yeah. technical expertise. Yeah. Still really good to be technically pro yeah oh yeah oh yeah no for sure like i mean you know have, have, having good good skills is is one of the most important things but it only gets you so far right being able to draw and paint is only part of the equation to to really get to that that high that high level like you know when you hear, you hear about the top artists you hear about the production designers and the art directors and stuff mm-hmm. uh, they're not there be only because of their their painting ability right their painting ability is great don't get me wrong it is amazing but uh, what's more amazing is the other skills that they possess the other things that you don't see that the production needs that's what makes someone a an amazing artist and once you once you start working and and you're around people like that it'll it'll, it'll make a lot more sense and hope someday (laughs) one day we'll have that opportunity (laughs) oh it's coming I think that is a great place to wrap up for uh, this session. I really appreciate you hopping on, Kenny. Uh, I'm just going to stop recording right now. So that is going to be everything for us today. We had a great discussion. It actually kept going for several hours after that. But, you know, you got to wrap up at some point for a podcast. If you guys like this, let me know. I know that Kenny is actually planning to have more of a presence in the tutorial space. So if you like him and you like what he does, make sure to send him some love on Instagram. Okay, I'll catch you in the next one.